And so that makes for a signal that will be radically different from the one experienced by microorganisms. And of course, this difference in the signals uh, is important in shaping the sensorial system, the sensory organs, as we shall see. Uh, second thing is that even though I didn't discuss this uh, in, uh, uh, in microbial organism and in amoeba, well, in amoeba it's, it's, it's sort of obvious, chemosensing is coupled to communication. Okay? So there, there's this twofold uh, use of chemosensing. On one way is just sensing the environment and going towards better environment. But it's, it's a sort of a one-way process. The environment changes because of many causes. And then you, you, the organism, you feel it, and then you try to go where the grass is greener or escape from hazardous conditions. And then there is another way to exploit sensing, which is using it for communication. I emit a signal, you receive it. So for amoeba, it's, it's very important. Cyclic AMP is a signal which is secreted by the cells. It's detected. And cells, while aggregating, also again emit cyclic AMP to form a trail for the cells that are behind them. So there is this relay of the signal from one cell to the other. So cyclic AMP in amoeba is already where sensing and communication are very well established. This happens also for bacteria. I haven't been discussing this issue at all. But as you might know, bacteria actually have quite elaborate ways of communicating between them through chemicals, diffusing chemicals. And probably the best known example is that of quorum sensing. So bacteria can send chemicals out, and then they, count, they can count how much of their fellows are around. And depending on how many of them are there, take decisions, cellular decisions. Right? So communication and chemosensing is used already at the microbial level. Obviously at the level of the social amoeba, and even more conspicuously at the level of higher organisms. Insects, mice, mammals of any kind, but also reptiles use olfactory signals. Insects are sort of a favorite example because this sort of olfactory communication has been extremely specialized, which makes them sort of examples of choice, which I will make. And I would ju also justify why talking about insects is relevant also for mammals and higher organisms. So as I was starting to, to discuss this morning, pheromones is the general term for olfactory signals that operate some communication between uh, individuals. Uh, the qualitative explanation for the evolution of such signaling is rather simple. In one way or another, any organism uh, disperses into the environment some metabolites. Okay. Uh, just think about a fish. Uh, just because it eats, it just uh, the, rem the, the remnants of, of alimentation are just dispersed in water. And these are chemicals, right? But also other products are leaking, hormones, right? And then hormones are already a signal which starts to be informative. Because it's, I mean, if, if, if fish just do pee and poo, okay, they're, they're alive, that's, that's all. But if they are leaking hormones, that's an information about their internal state, right? For instance, this might be a female fish leaking hormones that are coupled to the fact that she's going to have eggs soon. And eggs will have to be fertilized soon, right? So that's a signal that she may emit involuntarily initially. So initially, that's just some signal that gets out without any control. And then, by chance, there is a male which develops the ability to sense this odor, this hormone. And then this brings an advantage to the receiver, which is able to outcompete other males in 
running after the female and being the first to fertilize the eggs. But then at that point, if the female has an accrued ability of emitting these specific hormones, it emits more than that, then she will be able to attract more males. And then the advantage comes to the part of who emits. And so together, these two leads to a co-evolution of this specific trait of emitting and receiving, emitting and receiving. It's a sort of escalation to who emits better and who receives better. And then rapidly, this becomes highly specialized. Right? And the hormone maybe loses its original function and becomes effectively just a molecule which is emitted for the single sole purpose of inviting other fellows. Okay? Of course, this is sort of a prototypical example of communication via, via pheromones. But actually, there's a whole list of uh, functions for chemical signaling by our olfaction. And we will just go through this list because it's highly informative. Uh, so there are sex pheromones, which are the one I was discussing before. Typically, these evolved from uh, hormones or uh, metabolites in insects. Basically, all pheromones are molecules that resemble very much those that are left after uh, degrading the results of plant eating. Pl eating plants and fruits, then you have these small alcohols, which are highly volatile molecules, hydrocarbons. So it's something that insects typically emit in the environment just because they eat, right? And then these have become a signal for, uh, for females, different, differentiating uh, from, from uh, its original uh, uh, function. There are pheromones for aggregation. So calling the crowd together. Let's come together at some place. And typically, this is a defense mechanism. So individuals send signals to other individuals. Let's come together because uh, we are threatened. So in this sense, cyclic AMP might, might be seen as an aggregation pheromone for amoebas. Right? It serves the same function. Let's come together. Hard times are about to come. Let's come together and let's find a solution to a go somewhere else, via fruiting bodies, spores, etc. There's also there are also signals that promote aggregation in time rather than in space. So what is aggregation in time? It's just synchronization. Okay? Uh, this is particularly useful when, for instance, you have to lay your eggs all at one time. All individuals lay their, lay their eggs at the same time, and this sort of provide some advantage depending on species. So it becomes very soon a quite complicated problem of ecology, but there are some species that prefer synchronizing all their life cycles in order to depositing all the eggs at the same time, right? Uh, another very well-known example, everyone who has a dog has, knows this, scent marking. So depositing Odors to mark the territory, which is, say, property of a single individual. Marking the territory serves to uh, sort of invite other competing males to stay away from this place or just preventing them from engaging into uh, fights that might be hurtful for both contenders. So this is a highly social behavior which is actually elicited by these two sorts of pheromones. Come together, stay apart, delimit your ter territory. And another conspicuous example is social organization, like in ants. Actually, all the workers are kept in place by odorous signals by the queen. The queen keeps this social organization by inhibiting the uh, normal development of uh, uh, all the workers through chemical signals, right? So social organization is mediated often by these uh, odorous signals. Similarly, recruitment, that is uh, inducing other individuals to do something 
via other signals, right? Which is a similar way of so social uh, division. And then alarm pheromones, sending signals that let other fellows understand that there is some danger, right? Uh, also, all these are actively important uh, uh, communication signals. Uh, we will focus on the mechanism of sex pheromone communication because it's something that has evolved under a very strong pressure in some specific insects. So we can study this phenomenon in, a, in some animal models uh, which have developed an, an exquisite uh, ability to exchange signals to detect them because they are on, under an enormous evolutionary pressure. So these, these insects are moths. Okay. They, are, they, are they belong to uh, the Lepidoptera. These moths usually uh, live by night. Okay. Uh, they, they start their activity at dusk, fly by night, and rest during the day. Now there are at least two families of these moths which are called Saturnidae, to which this moth belongs, which is called Indian Luna moth. And then there are the, the Bombycidae, to which the silk moth belongs. That is the moth that comes from the silk worm. Uh, these two uh, families have a very, very peculiar lifespan. So they, lay, they live all their lives basically as caterpillars in the larval stage. Then when they undergo uh, metamorphosis and they become butterflies, flying uh, insects, uh, they live in this adult stage, which is the only one where they can reproduce as moths, only a few days. And then they die. And the reason why they live so, so few days when they're adult is that they have no mouth Actually, they have something which resembles a mouth, which is just a, a remnant of the mouth that they had when they were caterpillar, but it doesn't function at all. It's just vestigial. And they have no guts at all. So even, even if they have mouth, they cannot digest anything. So they live just five or six days. That's the time that it takes to consume all the lipid resources that they had just set, by, set aside while they were caterpillars, okay? So invariably this thing makes me think that adult moths behave like human teenagers, pretty much. Uh, so uh, they just live a few days eating lipids all the time and the only thing that they can think about is reproduction. So during these five days of life, frantically these moths look for a partner. Uh, they start looking for them at dusk and they try four or five times to have this reproduction going on. So how does this work? Well, the mechanism is very peculiar. Typically, there's a female sitting somewhere on a branch or typically in a rather open space. Uh, near a crop field, because when they were caterpillars, they start in a crop field, so they uh, become uh, moths in nearby crop fields, and then they maybe fly a little bit around, then at dusk, they sit for maize and start emitting pheromones from the specialized glands. They emit these amounts of pheromones, which are dispersed by the wind in the atmosphere. So they diffuse, and then there is a male, which may be far away, which detects this signal and flies to the female. And when, when it's close to the female, then there's all this sort of courtship begins and there are further uh, preliminaries that have to take place and then eventually, if everything goes well, there will be uh, mating. So the idea is that the, the female sends her specific message, it broadcasts it into the atmosphere. 
this flies, this message uh, is carried by the wind, and since there is turbulence in the atmosphere, because that's the typical behavior of fluid flow at our Reynolds number, so it's very different from the viscous fluid experienced by a bacterium. It's something which is very regular and changes. It suffices to have a, a wind of a few centimeters per second, 20, 30 centimeters per second, to have a turbulent flow, something which is very regular, which tends to mix, to disperse very regularly. So that the male actually receives a signal which is very much disrupted. It is diluted because the molecules go all the way. It is interrupted because there's mixing of patches of clean air, mixing with patches with, with are felt with odor because turbulence mixes everything and causes all sorts of filaments to be produced by, by fluid motion. And uh, worse than that, the signal may be also mixed to other odors, plant odors, odors of other insects. So it's far from being an environment which just uh, it, there's this odor arriving. There are other messages which interfere with this. There's crosstalk. But nonetheless, what is impressive is that the males are able to discriminate this signal and fly to the female. And they are so effective in doing so that typically the range of distances from which a male can reach a female is in the hundreds of meters, hundreds of meters away. There are some documented cases for the Indian Luna moth where marked males have been able to find the female from 10 kilometers away. Right? So this is sort of exceptional case. But already, if you think about it, hundreds of meters away, it's, it's pretty an impressive feat. So what are the problems that the male must encounter in this detecting the signal, interpreting, and flying it to the female fast enough and faster than other males? Because there's scrambling competition. The first who comes has, has larger chances of reproduction. So they must fly there fast, too. So there are three problems in this signaling. It's just like placing a phone call on an extremely disturbed line, right? So the, pre the first problem is the intensity of the signal. On this line, the signal fades away very rapidly because the molecules get dispersed away by the wind. So a moth is a small animal, centimeters. The gland is millimeters. So they cannot produce an enormous amount of pheromone. Actually, they produce a few nanograms per hour. Right? So the, already the concentration at the source of pheromones, it's already very small. It's in the picomolar. Right? So it's a feeble concentration here. You can imagine what it is hundreds of meters away. We will estimate it in a second. It's going to be pretty low anyway. Right? So there's first a the problem of intensity. They have to be very sensitive to this because it's a matter of life and death for them. Second, the quality of the signal, that is, it has to be the right odor. As we will see in a second, one other striking fact is that actually most do not use pure odors for communication. They rather use blends. So typically it's two or three Molecules mixed to, together in some proportion that make for the right signal. If you give them just one of them, they respond a little. If you give two of them but in wrong proportion, they might not respond at all. So it's the right mix that, make, that makes the response. And then again, you understand, if it's the right, right mix, you don't want this mix to be disturbed by other odors, by other signals, right? So there's also a problem, problem of discrimination of the odor, which is very important. And the third problem is the structure of the signal. Initially, moths just produce, female moths produce this continuous emission. Okay? So it's just a certain number of molecules per unit time that continuously diffuses away from the female. But what the male gets is very different from this. It's a signal that is on and off. We will see a time trace in a second. 
it's highly perturbed by, by turbulence. So the time structure of the signal is something also that is a problem, but also we will see an opportunity because it contains information about the location of the source. So first problem, intensity. How can ever a moth detect such minute concentration of pheromone far away from the, male, from the female? Well, the trick is, is in the nose. These moths actually do not have nose because the sensory organs for olfaction are the antennae, right? And these antennae are quite impressive organs. You see them, uh, these are these sort of feathery objects. But if you look at the moth uh, at the right time, and typically, well, I don't know, in Europe it's typically during summertime and maybe uh, it's, all, it's all over the year. Uh, but you can see them, uh, it's, it's a very impressive uh, uh, pair of organs. Uh, how are they made? Uh, that's the structure. So this is one antenna, which has a long branch from which several dozens of branches are departing. And on each branch, there are hundreds to thousands of these hairs which are actually depicted here and are called also sensilla. So that actually in one, on, on one antenna there are of the order of 10,000 of these sensilla. And each sensillum contains typically two neurons. And these neurons are the sensory neurons that detect the message. In the sense that on the cell membrane of these neurons there are GPCR receptors which essentially detect the presence of the odor and then send an electrical signal down towards the central nervous system to be interpreted and give rise to action. So this array of sense scylla is so well organized in space that it actually captures basically all important molecules that arrive. A key role in this is played by the fact that uh, you see, in this sensillum there are some pores. So this is sort of a rigid cap that, is a, uh, that covers the neurons. Uh, and there are pores. So the other molecules come, enter into the pore. And inside this sheath, there is a liquid, a lymph. So these odors get solubilized into the lymph, then bind to other proteins that bring them to the receptor. And this step of getting in water and getting solubilized and accumulated is crucial to give a very high absorption of molecules in this case, right? So that basically no molecule es escapes here. They come here, they hit diffusively on the surface, and then they can come in. Because again, this sub these objects are again very small. So at this scale, again, diffusion takes over. And so your capture is very high. Because every one of these pores actually acts, acts like a receptor, and so it's just like having a full absorbing, fully absorbing uh, antenna. Uh, as a result, in the laboratory, it's been shown that if you just give of the order of a handful of molecules of pheromones in one second, you can see cardiac responses, heartbeat changes. This is not yet a behavioral response which preludes flight, right? But at this, such very small concentration, still you can see that they have felt the odor. They don't start flying yet, but they start to being ready for it at such very low concentration. You see, we, here we, we are just hitting the physical limits of communication. You cannot have less than a handful of molecules. I mean, you need to have something, some signal. Less than this, there's only zero, right? So order of magnitude-wise, we are really reaching the limits of detection. In order to have a behavioral response, so insects typically start flapping their wings, ready to start and to fly, you need higher concentration. When I mean higher, I mean 10 to the minus 18 molar, which is not high at all, right? It's one billionth of nanomolar. So it's really very small. It's something like the order of 
1,000 molecules on the antenna. With 1,000 molecules on the antenna, the insect is ready to fly it. Right? So that's very impressive. That, that's the evolutionary solution that the insect has come up with in order to deal to the, with the fact that typically you will see very few molecules of pheromones, but this is a very precious signal and you don't want to lose it. So let's now try to follow a little bit the fate of this signal along the central nervous system, the, along the road that takes to the central nervous system, right? We won't go in big detail, but since it, this is something which is radically different from single-celled organism, and it's, instead it's very typical of a higher organism, we'll just have a look at what happens during these stages. So the first stage, the, re, the odor binds the receptor, and then this must become an electrical signal that goes, yes, yeah, sure. It's better to wait for the microphone because I can't hear you. Uh, and so outside molecule diffuse in air, right? So are they only diffusing or because the insect is flying, it's also like? Yeah, but again, uh, the point is that these structures are pretty small, start to be, I don't know, you see the scale? This is one millimeter, right? Mm -hmm. So these objects are sort of uh, in length, uh, I don't know, 50 microns. And so this is 10 microns. So we are back to micron scale. So here, the fact that the insect is flying or moving its antenna doesn't matter much. Diffusion still is the most important diffusion transport mechanism at the level of a single sensillum. Of course, at the level of the whole antenna, you start to feel the fact that you, you move, you fly. That's important. But when it gets close here, then it's diffusion that dominates outside. Then inside what happens, it's again diffusion, right? Now it's in a liquid, so a different diffusion coefficient, different viscosity. Uh, but here the crucial point is that they have to bind some intermediate molecules which are inside the lymph, which capture them and shuttle them to the neurons, right? So there are... These are abundant, very abundant, the, these shuttle proteins. So every single molecule that enters the pore, every other molecule that enters the pore, is immediately captured and diffuses quite rapidly across this very short distance, which is now has become really submicron. And so very quickly, hits the neuron. And the neuron is basically covered with just these GPCR receptors. Okay, so it's... Basically, what happens for microorganisms only that there are several layers of transmission of this signal. So you have absorption from here to the surface of the sheath, and then from inside to the surface of the neuron. And there are also other interesting things. This one-dimensional structure actually favors even more trapping. Right? It's a geometry that makes you... Uh, absorb stuff even more effectively than a sphere in three-dimensional space. It's the so-called phenomenon of dimensional reduction, right? So it's sort of well engineered by, by evolution in order to maximize the, the uptake rate of these other molecules. So we were, so first term, transduction of the chemical signal into uh, an electrical signal. That's pretty classical in, uh, in how neuron works. So suppose you, these are actual experiments done with Drosophila. Uh, that's something which is done routinely. Uh, you take your insect, you place it there. Then you just put an electrode near the sensilla in the antennae. And then you measure your uh, electric current and potential here, right? So, and then you submit them to some sort of stimuli that you arrange for. Here is a pulse of odor. So no odor, odor, no odor, and then you see what the response is in potential. And you see what, I, what you see is, is typical. There is a, a baseline voltage here going down, which is called the local field potential. And on top of that, all these spikes, right? That's the activity of the neuron that spikes and spikes. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know, some of you maybe have, have gone into a, a, a neuro, uh, neurophysiology lab. And actually, when you enter there, uh, you, the only thing that you can see, you can hear is, ta -dan, ta -dan, ta -dan, ta -dan, 
because all these experiments, when you, trans when you transduce this to the computer, it, it makes typical the sound of uh, neurons spiking. Uh, so when the odor is zero, there is a sort of baseline response. So this is tan, 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 tan. Then the odor arrives. That's, that's what, you, what you hear, really, right? I just lowered it down a bit because it's three seconds over all the other, but that's the idea. Okay? Now, a question that has been addressed very recently, and it's very neat, actually, explanation, and is can we relate the height of the potential and the frequency of spikes to the initial signal? So can we sort out in the language that we, we've been using until to this morning, a response function for this signal. Is there a response function? Is this working in some linear regime? Well, the amazing answer is that yes. Basically, you can sort out a response function, for instance, that maps the other signal to the local field potential, which is the baseline without the spikes, right? And this filter is just done like that. It's a single lobe filter, which what it does is simply it, it, just, it just smoothens the other signal over some length scale of, uh, say, 50 milliseconds, right? So even if you just give your other a very sharp change, it will sort of smooth it out and reverse the sign by this filter. That is what you see, you see, right? So this gives you the the smooth part of the signal. And then you just go from the smooth part to the spiking part with another filter. And what does this filter do? Well, this is a filter with two lobes, which does sort of derivative of the local field. So you see, this is not perfectly, perfectly adapting. The two lobes are not the same, right? So that's the reason why in absence of signal, you still have some response. Because you're not making the difference of this. You're just always adding something. Even if it's zero, it will give up something positive here. Because the sum of two lobes is not zero. And that's the baseline response. But then, when the potential goes down, this negative part wins again, and then you start ta -ta -ta -ta. Then you reduce. Then when you are going down, it goes exactly to zero, and then you recover your baseline frequency response. So actually, what you see here is basically the same thing that we saw yesterday for, for bacteria. It's the actual spike response, which is compared with the prediction that you have by making the convolution of the other signal with the filter, right? So you're sort of using the response function, reconstructing the response just by using the response function and predicting a new response. You use the response function for this signal, for this pulse. It's not a, a spike, but uh, it's not a pulse very short. It's a long pulse. But from this response, you can derive the responses to different sorts of odors. And you see that they relate very well with the observed ones, which means that this system as well has a reasonable range where it responds linearly to other stimuli through these response functions. But there's no adaptation here. There is partial adaptation, non perfect adaptation. There is partial adaptation because if you stayed very long on this, on this level, you would have seen that there is a slight decrease in the frequency of the spikes, which is due to the fact that actually there is some cancellation between these two lobes. Not a perfect one, but there is some. Okay? So that's the very first part of signal transduction, converting other signals into electric signals, and it pretty, pretty much works like a linear transducer. Then you, if you ask quantitative question about how this thing works, then you will see that comparing odors of different height, different odors, right? You, you pretty much find the same thing. And one imp impressive result is that the dependence on the intensity of the odor is not very strong. Of course, if the odor is more intense, there are more molecules, it will respond more. But it's not very much amplified, 
right? So something different is taking place here. It doesn't seem that the signal is much encoded into in, in its intensity. But on the contrary, what you see is that the ver there is a very accurate timing going on. If you change the duration of the signal, then the outcome is very much follows this, right? So here it seems that there's something more important in the time dependence of the signal rather than the amplitude. You, this you just you infer from the fact that you change odors, you change uh, intensities, and you always see that the timing is very accurately regulated. Whereas in the intensity may vary, it's not something very, it doesn't seem that inset pay much attention to intensity. Okay. More, the more is, is better, but not crucially so. Then the signal goes to higher centers of processing, and we will just see in the following what, what it does. But before going to this, let's discuss first the second aspect, which is uh, how can and how, happens, how it happens that insects respond to different other blends. So this is sort of classical example of, of a very, very peculiar, very interesting uh, communication systems in, uh, uh, in two species of moths, which are actually uh, strongly related. So here you can see there are two females of the same species, which is the European corn borer. It's a pest. Typically, it devastates cornfields. Uh, when it turns to a moth, uh, it communicates via pheromones. There are two strains of this uh, family. Two strains means that uh, they are different. Right? But they can mate together. They are part of the same species. If you put them together, they mate and they produce offspring. But they are two strains which actually communicate through two different pheromones. And these two different pheromones are the same molecule actually, only differently arranged in space. Two isomers. There is a double carbon bond which is in a different position here and here. If this is the E version, it's the double bond is here. If it's the Z version, the tail of this hydrocarbon molecule is slightly different. But still, this E strain communicates using only the E molecule, and the Z strain uses only the Z molecule. And if you put a male of the Z strain, he will not be able to respond to the signal by a female of the E strain, and vice versa. So these two signals have sort of diverged. But still, they belong to the same species, so they can mate. So if they happen by chance to be there, they will be mating. But if they're far apart, they won't, because the male won't be able to recognize this as the good signal. And now we go to another species which is related to these two, which is the Asian corn borer. And what this species does, it produces a blend of 50-50 of the two isomers. So it's 50% one, 50% the other. And then the, the male of the species responds to this combination. It doesn't respond to this, it doesn't respond to this, and the males of this do, do not respond to this. So you see, it's very subtle. There must be a way inside the insect brain to understand that this is the right proportion. Actually, if you do experiments with various changing this concentration, you can see that if you do 40-60, 40% of one, 60% of the other, or the other way around, the insect won't respond. But it's, if it's, I don't know, I don't remember the actual figures, I think it's 48-52, then they will. So there is a very fine capability of distinguishing which is the right blend. And of course, it has to be so, because if you follow the wrong signal, you will engage yourself in a race that will take you, I don't know, from minutes to hours, and then there won't be any mating, because there can't be. And then you've lost one of your five opportunities, basically. What I wanted to say uh, more on this slide. Oh, so that's very interesting, because also this provides a very straightforward mechanism for speciation, for the 
arising of new species. You start with a signal, which is a blend. Then some individual starts producing slightly different blends, right? They might have a hard time at the beginning, but then there are other maize which are sensitive by chance to that blend. And so they start mating together, but they at a certain time stop cross mating. Then these two proportions diverge, and then you're left with a new species. And this seems to be a, an effective mechanism for speciation in, uh, in, in moths. So how do they do at the neural level? How is this uh, recognition uh, accomplished? Uh, so let's, let's take a, a step further into the insect brain. Uh, here are the other molecules. These are the sensory neurons schematized. So on average sensory neurons, there, are, there is a typical receptor, just, just for simplicity. So our factory in a sensory neuron S1 as a receptor R1, S2 as a receptor R2, S3 as R3. And then this is another re receptor which has this uh, receptor, as another sensory neuron which has this receptor expressed. And this is typically the rule. Huh? Neurons typically express the vast majority of one specific receptor. For instance, in the silk moth, there are two neurons inside this sensillum. One of them is devoted to a plant odor, and the other one is devoted to bombicol, which is the sex pheromone in insects. So every neuron out of two is attuned specifically to the sex pheromone in, in, uh, in the silk moth. And it expresses only those kind of receptors. And so there are various other signals. For instance, odor A binds to receptor R1 only. Odor B may bind to receptors R2 and R1. Odor C may bind to receptor R3. Okay? These sensory neurons, which were the one that we've seen before, then send their spiking signal to higher processing centers. And the first processing center that they meet are glomeruli. These glomeruli are just assemblies of neurons localized in space, sort of hairballs of neurons. Their number of neurons that are there and the number of glomeruli may vary from species to species, but you might think figures of merit maybe from the 100 to 1,000 neurons in each of these are called neuropils, these balls of neurons. And then the signal from these neurons goes to the protocerebrum and further away for real processing down up to the cortex, right, through other intermediates. Uh, so what's the trick? How does it work? The idea is that the, using this glomeruli, the insect actually does a combinatorial discrimination, right? So this is, I, I hope you can see these this, this pictures here. So here there are five different odors, which is actually the same hydrocarbon chain, which is just five pieces, six pieces, just different lengths of the hydrocarbon chain. And then we are looking at, uh, in this case, at three different glomeruli in this micro in this glomerular complex, which makes this so-called antennal lobe, which is this ball of balls of neurons. And you can see that neuron, uh, sorry, glomerulus 17, which is the full line, responds preferentially to others 7 to 10. And instead, glomerulus 28 responds preferentially to other 5 to 7, right? And then you have a bunch of these glomeruli, so that a particular combination of glomeruli responding will identify one and single other blend, right? By using this combinatorial code, you have expanded factorially all the possible number of combinations, so you can accommodate for many, many different blends, right? So, and here you see the same thing. You see that different odors, the, 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 the white glomeruli are those that are responding, those that are active. You can view them by calcium imaging, really, live. Uh, and so, other C2 excites these two, and then a little bit this two. Other C6, this one, and less this, and then 
C7, this one very strongly. You see, to every different odor is associated a different pattern of glomeruli. And to different blends, more complex patterns of glomeruli. And these patterns of activation are then read by the higher nervous system center. So that's basically our current understanding of how this discrimination of odors and blends occurs in the uh, protocerebrum of, of insects. So now we're starting to delve something into inside the insect brain. So before going any further, but we won't go any further, one should anyway ask, uh, okay, uh, what's the relevance of this for our brain or for mammals in general? Well, it's pretty striking, but in fact, there is a very strong similarity in the architecture or the olfactory system in insects and in mammals. So the most prominent difference is that antennae are outside, whereas our and mammals' uh, olfactory system is hidden inside ourselves, right? So that's the only physiological big difference because structurally they're very similar. So you see insects have this main antenna lobe, which is this uh, set of glomeruli, which form the first uh, layer of uh, processing of the uh, odor signal. Uh, males, in addition, have a macroglomerular complex, which is, again, a set of glomeruli which are specific to pheromones. So this is an organ that females do not have. Odors, plant odors are processed here, plant and fruit odors. Sex pheromones are processed here. Females do not have this organ. But structurally, this is a copy of this one, okay? So these two information then go to a higher structure, which are the mushroom bodies. And then this goes to protocerebrum, et cetera. Here, information from motory signals starts to come in, vision, everything starts to be integrated, and then all this goes to the cortex, and then it's very complicated, as you know. Cognitive processes start. Now, if you compare this with the structure in the, uh, in the mammals, you will see a very close analogy in structures, even physiological analogy, right? They are made the same way. What is the antenna lobe it becomes the olfactory bulb and the accessory olfactory bulb specific to, to sexual odors. Uh, the piriform cortex and the amygdala play the role of mushroom bodies, which are also functionally one set of things, but divided by in two functional parts, like this. And then again, neocortical and subcortical pathways. So it seems very much that the architecture is the same. So this is also motivation to spend time on insects, hoping to understand something about uh, the mammal brain. So we've been looking at intensity, we've been looking at the quality of the signal. The only thing that is left is to understand what happens to the structure of the signal because of the presence of turbulence. So now th this was sort of a difficult experimental problem to assess which is the distribution of odors at hundreds of meters away from a source which is emitting odor. So the first problem is that still now we don't know how to produce synthetic pheromones, typically, and we don't know how to detect them. So all these experiments are actually experiments that come from an entirely different field of science, which is atmospheric physics, and we're done with other molecules, with other ideas in mind. That is, for instance, investigating how pollution arises in the atmosphere because of the presence of some toxic chemicals that are emitted by a source. But since this is just physics and we know that uh, for these molecules at such high Reynolds number, the details of what the, how the molecule is, what the molecule is, is not, are not very important, but what is important is how it is transported. Then we can learn lessons about the odor distribution using other chemicals as traces. And this is a time trace of a signal, now the, the chemical is a propylene, something which has nothing to do with pheromones, but still is volatile, so you can send it hundreds of meters away. And this is the 
uh, there is a, a detector for propylene, which is set out at the distance, uh, I think, 330 meters from, from a localized source downwind. And you see that the signal that is experienced at the detector is characterized by long blanks where there's no signal at all. So this is clean air that arrives on the detector. And then from time to time, there are these bursts. Little pockets where there is odor coming. So the signal is very intermittent. And as a result, actually, there are pockets where the signal might be extremely high, actually, even at a large distance from the source. And it's very instructive to look at these time traces when you put just figures into it, because these spikes can be as short as a few milliseconds, which is a very, very short time. And the longest clumps of these events may last even minutes. So there is a, an enormous range of time scale here in this signal, from very fast ones to very long ones, all the scales mixed together. Right? It seems also sort of a nightmare, but eventually we conjecture that the, in, the insects olfactory brain must have evolved to cope with this sort of signals. So its architecture, in some sense, must have been able to decode this sort of signals, because these are the, their typical environments. And it, this, this fact actually is, is, has been demonstrated experimentally, that there is this structure, not exactly this structure, but the fact that there are bursts, that the signal is on and off, is, is very important for the insect to understand that this, this is real, the message that I'm looking for. It's a very simple experiment that have been done, but very illuminating. So you take a male moth in the lab, you fix it, or you let it fly, just to start. Initially, it sees no odor, and it stands there. Then we, there's a, some little wind that goes towards the moth, and then you start submitting it to the odor. So you give a step pulse, and it's flowing towards the moth, then it arrives at the moth, and the moth feels it, and starts to fly. And after a few seconds, she sits back again, and it sits back again, and never, never flies anymore. So this is adaptation. It has, it has adapted to the signal. Okay? It's a new level, it's a constant level, but I don't care anymore. On the contrary, if you submit this insect to a signal that goes on and off rapidly enough, it starts to fly and continues to fly upwind. So in a sense, the insect here sees, okay, that, that's the right signal. I'm in the atmosphere, I'm in the right place, uh, there's going to be a female somewhere. Let me start and look for her. Right? So the fact that the signal is on and off is meaningful to the insect. And you can go further on, on this experimenting, actually. It's not only that the fact that the signal is on and off, but also the frequency of the signal matters. So you can submit your, these are insects, traces of insects flying in a wind tunnel. It's a small wind tunnel, sort of, a couple of meters long. The insect starts from down here, and the signal is emitted from there, and there is wind going in this direction. The only thing that this, this signal is sort of an on adagio, so its pulses are slow. One pulse, another pulse, third pulse, fourth pulse, and you see that the insect starts to go upwind, as it should, but sort of hesitates. As this behavior, which is being called crosswind casting, which is a sort of a hesitating behavior. So it looks pretty much more like a search behavior rather than a behavior which is directed to the source. But as long as you start producing faster pulses, say one-tenth of a second, tan, 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 then the insect starts and flies much more straight upwind. So this sense of time is something which matters a lot to the insect in order to 
understand where the source is and where it should fly. And then you ask yourself, well, how fast can I go? Which is the minimum time that it takes for a pulse to, be, to elicit a response? How important it is how these pulses are close to one another? So this question has been lingering for years, and only very recently, actually, a few months ago, uh, the first responses have emerged. The problem is that it's very difficult to produce in the lab very short odor pulses. This is just because you produce them mechanically with a valve, in, you open, you close. You can go reasonably to, say, 20 milliseconds, but it's very difficult to go below that scale. Right? It's a technical limitation. But then recently, there, there have been these optogenetic techniques. So it's possible to make uh, neurons that rather than expressing, it, these are olfactory neurons. So they sit into the uh, sensilla, but they do not express the olfactory receptors. They express rhodopsins, so it's receptors to light. So if you give a light stimulus, they will understand it as another stimulus. And light stimuli, you can make them as short as you wish, basically. And so by this method, recently the group by, uh, led by Kanzaki has shown that basically you have no response if the signal is less than one millisecond, the pulse, which is very short, but you already have 50% of the mosques that respond. And here responding is mean, meaning they really start to flap their wings. It's a behavioral response. 50% of the moths respond already to a signal which is 3 milliseconds. Now consider that typical time scale of neuronal dynamics are of the order of millisecond. So again, we are hitting on, onto the physical limits of communication in the time scale. They sense as fast as they could, basically. It's basically impossible to go faster than that. And it's not a coincidence, we think, that this sensitivity here, this time resolution here, sits exactly in the time scale of the shortest pulses that you observe in the atmosphere at hundreds of meters away. So the idea is that since in the atmosphere there are these such short pulses, the system, the sensory system has evolved in order to be able to catch these pulses as much as it could. Then you can go beyond, and then you can take two short pulses and ask yourself, how much will the mouth respond if, the, if, she sees, if it sees two pulses which are at a certain delay from one another? And then you clearly see that if the two pulses, which are, say, three millisec five milliseconds long each, if they are separated by 180 milliseconds, you have a certain response. But then when they come close enough together, the response grows. So they respond better to a couple of signals like, such as tan tan, with respect to tan tan, which is again a demonstration, but now at a refined, more refined level that the frequency matters, and it matters a lot. So eventually, what will be the behavior elicited by these signals that the moth sees the real signal in the atmosphere. Well, this, these are experiments that have been done many years ago. Basically, what have been, they did, they built a, a high tower, 25 meters high. They sat on top of this tower, and then they looked at moths from above, marked moths. So they put a female on one side, male on that side, 30 meters apart, which is not the maximum, but it's basically what you can afford typically for tracking, because it's very difficult to track over much larger distances. Uh, then these are in sealed cages, and cages are open, and then you start measuring the response. And then the trajectories that, are, that you observe are like this. So this is the mean wind. That's the female location. This is something 20 meters wide, 30 meters long, the field. The male starts here, and you see that there are 
pieces of trajectory where there is this zigzagging upwind behavior, then large crosswind behavior, then upwind, crosswind, upwind, crosswind. So one of the big questions that is uh, lingering, lingering now is, uh, can we understand this behavior starting from the knowledge of the input and the knowledge of how this is processed? So can we make the usual trick of going from the signal to the behavior, connecting them together by some reasonable model of how this signal is transduced? Does this search strategy represent some sort of optimal strategy in presence of signals that are very sparse? So all these sorts of questions. One very intriguing suggestion actually has been made a few years ago by comparing the actual, the actual flight of the moth, this is another trajectory similar to the previous one, right? So casting, crosswind casting, zigzagging upwind, casting upwind. So you can see trajectories like this of the sort. Even in uh, searchers, abstract searchers. So if you devise algorithms which are based on information search. So these are agents which look around in space for collecting information, right? They don't do chemotaxis because you cannot do chemotaxis in an environment that is highly variable such as this one. But then you change this with another thing which is infotaxis. You look for information about the, pre the location of the source, right? And if you do that in a way that I'm not able to expand on, but you can imagine the spirit, you try to collect information in space and move accordingly, then you see these sort of trajectories which sort of resemble the one that you see in the field. So the question is, is the insect brain producing such, implementing such sort of algorithms? This is really something really, really theoretical, right? We don't know yet. What we know, however, is that these algorithms require the presence in the brain of a spatial map. So inside the brain, there must be a structure which has information, as a representation, a cognitive representation of space. Because this sort of algorithms won't work if you do not have at least a coarse representation of space. So the question is, do insects have such sort of structure? We don't know yet. This is still under discussion. Actually, at the time, people think that they, do don't, they don't. Because now we know that mammals do. Mice do have a spatial representation of the brain. And humans do have the same structure as mice. This has been shown just a couple of weeks ago, right? So how do mammals have a representation of space, a map of space. This is something which is really very fascinating. These are ex basically all this research on this has been spurred in the group of Mosers, of the Mosers uh, in uh, Norway. Uh, so what you can see here is that it, these are, in black you can see trajectories of a mouse, actually no, a rat, they work with rats, sorry, a rat moving in a square arena. So this black is the trajectory of the rat that is moving. Uh, there is no stimulus here, it's just moving around. Okay? And the, the red dots are the location in space where some specific neurons fire in the, in the rat brain. These are neurons in a special part of the brain which is called the entorhinal cortex. And these specific neurons are called the grid cells. So you can see that this specific neuron, it's one neuron which is touched upon with an electrode, fires every time that the, mo the, the, the mouse passes in this specific point. And if you just do the histogram of frequencies, so this is the number of, fi of times that the neuron is fired in a given location of space, you see that all these points sit on a triangular grid. 
So inside the rat brain and inside our brain, there is a specific zone of the brain in which there are specific neurons that fire every time we walk on a point in an abstract three-dimensional grid, uh, two-dimensional grid, which has the triangular form. So inside our brain, a, there is hardwired the notion of space in the form of a hierarchy of triangular grids of different scales. So certainly mouse, mice, rats, humans, and probably most mammals have this structure. Insects do not have the physiologic analog of this structure. So we don't know if they have maps or not because they lack the analog in, uh, in the brain. But still, this means that, at least for mammals, this sort of information-looking strategies might be feasible. We don't know if insects do the same as well, or what they do. So time to wrap up everything. Conclusion, very short. Chemosensing is pervasive at all scales, from microbes to humans, and it's a very important communication means. Second conclusion, this is more of a methodological one. Working at different scales requires different models. You have to build the right phenomenological model at your given scale, right? You don't want to start necessarily from the molecular biology to build up up to behavior in a single step, right? You don't want to even try. You work at the molecular level, you try to understand molecular level. You work at the cell level, try to understand that level. And then you try to dare to make the connection. Can I understand this cell behavior from the microscopic one? And can I, from the cell behavior, understand the behavior of tissues? And from the behavior of tissues, that are organs? And from that organs, that are organism? And behavior, right? And you just slice your problem in, in pieces at the beginning, and then you try to make the connection. Right? And I think that chemosensing bacteria is a good example of how these levels might be built up and then connected. Sort of might serve as a template for approaching complex biological problems from a physics perspective. Last two slides. This, I put them in the end, which is sort of nonsensical, but these are the motivation slides. So why should we care about this? And actually, there are two answers for, for this thing. And I like them both, right? So one is, is specific to olfaction. So why should we care to know how a moth perceives odors? I mean, it's, it's their business, right? It's, it's really personal. It's sex, after all. So the motivations are actually many from a social viewpoint. Typically, these are pests. So if you are able to understand how they communicate to mate, and you can in intervene in this process by disrupting it, you can save your agriculture, right? So this is something which has already been done. Disruption of mating via artificial pheromone baits, right? And you can even trap them. You can send them away. You can confound them with these odor signals, right? They understand only that in that time. So you, you should take advantage of that in order to carry them away. Second, infectious diseases are often carried by vectors. And often these vectors are insects. And often these are flying insects, right? And then, why not use these strategies to destruct them or to capture them? This is something that has been done. And is currently done and is under active research. And it's something which is very important, right, for public health. Artificial noses. There are now artificial noses. These noses fall short of reaching the sensitivity of the dog nose by six orders of magnitude. Right? It's still a very long way. What are these artificial noses for? Lots of things. Detecting explosives, detecting noxious chemical substances in low concentrations, detecting cancer, 
because you can smell cancer, and dogs do, actually. And you can have a very early diagnosis of some cancers just by smelling the patients, with, if your dogs are trained to, the, to do this. And of course, training a dog takes months, but if you have an artificial nose, you could do it large scale and low cost. So artificial noses, why are we short of six orders of magnitudes? Emerging idea from looking at the olfactory physiology, we are missing a liquid layer between the odor and the receptors. Everything is working on air onto solid. New generation of artificial nose, water, liquids. This might help, okay? It's still, of course, under. But the idea is that biomimesis try to imitate what evolution took billions of years to, to build up. And fourth thing, which you might not be aware of, but maybe this is just something of a European thing at the time, but in several places in Europe now, in shops and malls, uh, people are emitting odors which uh, have the uh, purpose of making you have a better experience as a customer and possibly inducing you to stay there more and at one time or another maybe money will flow out of your pockets. Okay. This goes under big, big stuff which is called sensorial marketing. Big money seems to be entering around this aspect at the time. So you might be interested or not, I'm not particularly, but it exists. And then the other side of the motivation. Now, now I'm taking an, ex an excerpt, if it's there, I hope. Yeah, there it is. This is from our Berg's book, E. coli in Motion. I, I actually inspire myself a lot in these lectures on the works of Howard Berg. Actually, he's the father of this chemosensing stuff in bacteria. And just what he says that, is this practical? I don't care. It's, it's fascinating. It just arouses my curiosity, and then I will go for it. And then I'm closing with this. So now I'm ready to take questions if you still feel that you can resist. I have a few questions basically regarding the turbulent motion of the fluid. Maybe it will go to turbulence and structure of turbulence rather than anything to do with chemosensing. Uh, so first of all, uh, as we know, there are these boundary layers around objects uh, when a fluid is in motion, right? So that effectively sort of might prevent molecules from reaching the surface? Okay, so um, now you, you're, there are different kinds of layers, okay? So there are viscous layers, yeah. okay, where the motion of the fluid is very slow because it, fluid has to be attached to the rigid surface. Uh, and then there are diffusive layers, right? So this is the layer where uh, the concentration may vary very strongly. Uh, in our, so at, it, it's everything a matter of scales, of course, right? So uh, uh, these viscous layers might be of the order of sub-millimeter scale in the, with typical winds, right? So there is effectively around the insect a small zone where there's very little velocity moving. Uh, so that's actually the zone where the, uh, the importance of the flow stops and then diffusion takes in. But that's, that's good because actually diffusion is even better in transporting stuff and sending them to receptors. So it's, uh, it's waking on the good side. And then coming to the burst due to turbulence, so how does this pulse width or frequency or spatial extent uh, vary with respect to distance from the source? Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, actually, nobody knew. No? And so this might be the subject of a of sort of a research talk because we're, we're currently writing down the paper. So I can tell you that there are specific power laws that govern the dependence from the distance. 
And then you can find out these power laws using the theory and predict them and you compare them with different flows. And so that's currently we have at hand a theory to understand how the signal goes, which are, which are the frequencies that are exposed. Uh, there are specific properties that we can understand uh, starting from the general theory of turbulent diffusion uh, in, in turbulence. Uh, so, I don't know, I can give you figures, but uh, they're not particularly relevant. So the typical concentration in a, in a pulse goes uh, down with the square of the distance from the source. Uh, the typical uh, distance that you can, where the signal is still above the sensitivity threshold is of the order of uh, one kilometer, order magnitude wise. Uh, the, I don't know, the typical distribution of the length of a pulse is actually given by power law. So it, it, there's not a typical length of the pulse, but you have pulses of all scales, which I was just mentioning qualitatively before. They can go from milliseconds to several seconds or minutes. So all these quantitative laws, now we have them. And what we're doing, we're planning to use them and propose these true signals to insects in the laboratory and to see if they respond differently to these true signals rather than to fake signals, just like periodic pulses, to see if they really recognize, oh, that's, that's the atmosphere. So does the, specifically, does the frequency go up or down as you go near the source? As, when, you go now, when you go near the source, everything speeds up. Okay. Right? So everything is faster, and then you approach it faster. So things are getting better as you get better. Once you make the big step is from far away, suppose you start at 500 meters away. If you can make it from 500 to 100, then your chances are very high that you will make it from 100 to 50, and, and so on and so forth. So oh, one last, last sure, question. Sure. Uh, so how large are these spatial pockets of concentration? Because if you average in some sense, are you losing information because you are averaging over different pockets or you gain strength? Well, actually, these pockets are sized as much as the puffs, as much as, as, much as the pulses, right? So. When you are in these clumps of signals, you basically alternate on and off on similar time scales. Uh, I'm talking perpendicular to the wind direction. Uh, perpendicularly. Yeah. So the lateral extension actually is proportional to the distance. So there's a cone inside which you will still feel signals, right? Uh, and so it's uh, a cone that is, uh, has an aperture angle that is basically the ratio of uh, velocity fluctuations to mean wind. So it's something like uh, going from one-fifth to one-tenth in, uh, in the atmosphere. So it's a rather elongated cone, the aperture, I don't know, it's 20 degrees, roughly. But if you are hundreds of meters away, then there's a wide extent in the crosswind direction. Thanks. Uh, so maybe just to add to these questions, uh, if the source itself is moving, does it happen with insects, and could it pose a problem, and do they have Typically, it doesn't. If it moves, it poses a, pro poses a problem, yes, because the search becomes a more difficult problem, certainly, already from a theoretical viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So you, you can do mathematics about these search problems, and then in, in presence of a standing queue, you can build up effective strategies. Is the source is moving and the queue is changing, the search is more difficult. But what, it happens that females stay put. If they do so for max, to, in order to maximize the probability of the male to find them, it's reasonable but unproven. You might think that they might wish to do so, sort of rendezvous strategy, right? It's pretty asymmetric. You know? They might be rendezvous. Both start and try to find themselves at some place. Both of them emit something and look for the same something. So you might conceive this is faster, right? We don't know. Theoretically, it's so. But it also makes sense evolutionarily that the female stays put and that all the males scramble to get at the female. And then she chooses, you're OK, you're not. But that's typical in biology, because it's females that make the largest investment in laying eggs, energetic investment. So they have the right to choose, evolutionarily speaking. That's typical in. Uh, no, so, so for mating, and maybe especially for moths, this might be true, but there are other contexts in which pheromones are used or chemical signals are used. And yes, there are. 
I don't know if there's a general rule. You also must understand that this system is special because there's this, an enormous pressure, evolutionary pressure on this function at best, so all these aspects just pop out immediately. Maybe in, in a behavior of a mammal, which has many, many chances of reproducing, uh, there are other aspects that count. So I didn't tell you all the story, but actually, there is a second stage of selection. So the male arrives first, very good. But then in many species, when it arrives there, he has to sort of make a showdown. He shows that he has spe special organs, which are very large and bright. And actually, these special organs are a proxy for its availability in proteins and lipids. So it means, okay, you see, I can show you that during my caterpillar life, I have been living really great. And I promise that your progeny will do the same. But that's how it goes, basically, right? So even in insects, there are further stages of selection. In, in other complex organisms, it's difficult to say which is the limiting step for selection of mates, etc. If this, if this answers the question. So uh, uh, while explaining the functions of chemotaxis, yeah. While explaining the functions of chemotaxis, uh, you have explained uh, a response as a function of gradient. If you have linear uh, sort of gradient, what will be the response? And if you have pulse-like gradient, what will be the response? Do you want me to go to the slide? Uh, uh, yes, maybe if you can. Yes, yeah. yes. In that case, if the, uh, the, the, uh, the gradient itself is moving, so I mean, or if that is uh, coming in the uh, in the form of you pulses, know. rather. Right. If it's moving, uh, right. That's the, that's it's the one case, or or in the case in which such pulses are coming with uh, with some time differences. Yeah. So in that case, neither this response nor this response will be the best. There will be another one. So the idea is that every specific to every specific form of the concentration, mm -hmm. just choose one, like you did. Mm -hmm. I want a pulse which travels here. I want two pulses, three pulses, and mm. pulses, whatever. Mm. You choose one, there will be one optimal response to this. Mm. For every concentration, you can pick up the optimal response. Mm. The problem is that that specific optimal response will typically perform very bad in other conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you, your environment is always repeating like that, mm -hmm. it's always waves and mm. waves and waves and waves forever, then you better stick to the specialist response. I'm specializing in waves because mm -hmm. that's what I always see. Mm -hmm. And if a wave comes, I will catch it, right? But if your environment is something that now it's waves, tomorrow is static patch, the day after tomorrow is gradients, right? In that case, you better turn to a generalist strategy mm -hmm. where you can face all these different environments always getting something out of it. That was the, the bottom line message. Mm -hmm. But if you have pulses of certain width, if that is coming over the time or, or different time periods, the response will be uh, something like it goes in the direction in which that pulse is coming. But in this case, it's going, I mean, it will become random. Uh, that's somewhat uh, so counterintuitive. Let me try to understand. I mean, if it's a pulse coming, right, like this, moving. Right. And then you mean, you mean I can climb up the gradient, but then when I go down, well, that's, okay. is, that, is that the question? Uh, no, I mean such pulses are coming. I mean at a different times. Different yeah, they are appearing and disappearing. Uh, like, uh, uh, like that. Just, just before in uh, two slides before you explained, right? I mean, so uh, pulses of certain width. Now you're now you're thinking about the the atmosphere. Uh -huh. Yeah, but that's a completely different situation, okay. yeah, right? So you, you're you're asking yourself what a, what a bacterium could do if it sends the signal like the one in the atmosphere. Right. Okay. In that case, it would be very complicated for him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for it, it's very difficult because it's not the typical environment that they see, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because diffusion tends to smear everything. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to produce pulses at the micron scale mm -hmm. because you, you would have to keep your concentration very tight, but diffusion always tends to send you very much away. Mm -hmm. So it's, very, it's, it's extremely unlikely that the bacterium sees this sort of signals. Okay. But if it were to see it, there would be some sort of response, which of course would have to be with a very, very short time because you, you need to react fast okay. to this gradient that comes and then disappears. Okay. And your response will be very, very fast, going up and down very, very rapidly. Okay. 
But this doesn't happen because they just don't see that, never see something like this. Okay. Then good luck for your projects. See you tomorrow.